What are the basics of TFT? There are two things you essentially need to worry about. First is going to be resource management, and the second is going to be your team composition. Sounds simple enough, but this guide will walk you through everything you need to know to make decisions in your game. Think of the concepts in this video as a framework to use to make optimal decisions. This video will be for intermediate and advanced players who want to get a more theoretical understanding of TFT. First, let's go into resource management. So there are three resources in Teamfight Tactics, gold, health, and items. You must maximize your resources in order to make the best team compositions. This involves balancing all three of these throughout the game so that you don't fall too far behind in certain stages. For example, if you lose all of your HP early on because you saved all your gold, you'll need to win every single fight in the late game to do well. On the other hand, if you use all your gold in the early game and win every round, you might not have enough economy to build a strong late game composition and then get outscaled. The same goes for saving and using items. Items can be saved in order to make perfect items in the late game, or they can be built early on so that you save HP. Again, you need to have a balance. Here's how gold works. The more gold you have, the easier it is to get even more. Gold is also worth more in the early game than it is in the late game. It's sort of like real life. Gold can be traded for champions, shop refreshes, and experience. This may sound very simple, but maximizing gold is the singular most important part of TFT. Why do pro players always have a lot of gold? They save it up. But then, why do they also have so much health all the time too? Health is a little different from gold, but what if I told you that TFT players are alchemists? We can turn gold into health and health into gold. Here's how. If you spend your gold, you save health, at least theoretically. And then if you don't spend your gold, you're most likely going to lose a bit of health. This isn't always the case, but this is what happens most of the time. Of course, this is dependent on your board strength at certain stages, but that's for the second part of this guide. That brings up the question of how much gold should we spend each round. This also brings up the issue of gold efficiency. We already discussed the three ways to use gold, but I'll simplify it into two. The first is shop refreshes and champions, which kind of go hand in hand, and then the second way is experience. So shop refreshes and champions strengthen your team, but it's not guaranteed that you will become stronger because you can get unlucky. However, it gives you a huge potential to get stronger by getting unit upgrades or rare units that can fill out key synergies. It's kind of like a high risk, high reward. Experience, on the other hand, gets you levels. Levels allow you to play more units and give you higher shop odds. The difference between spending your gold on experience versus shop refreshes and champions is that leveling up gives you guaranteed board strength because you will always be able to field an extra unit when you level up. However, this upgrade isn't that big unless you already have a unit that is powerful for your team to add in. This means if you are leveling up to strengthen your team, make sure that you actually have someone good to put in, not because a leveling guide told you to level up. Oftentimes I see players leveling up because they saw it in a guide, and then they put in a worthless unit because they didn't have anything else. This can often be a waste of gold, and instead what players should do is either roll at their current level or level up and then roll after. So let's go over the pros and cons of all three options we discussed. So refreshing the shop and buying units, also called rolling, can drastically improve your team with upgrades and higher cost units. And you can also stop rolling whenever you like. So you could roll 10 gold, you could roll 20 gold, you could roll 50 gold as much as you want based on your current situation. The only bad part about refreshing your shop and buying units is that it's not guaranteed to actually improve your team. Because sometimes you get unlucky. So the times you would just refresh your shop and buy units is when you already have a lot of pairs on your bench. This increases your odds for hitting key upgrades and can also get you access to the rare units. For example, if you really need a 4 cost or a legendary unit and you have 3 pairs on your bench, you're rolling for 4 things. Compare this to someone else who has no pairs on their bench and already has a bunch of the four costs that they need. If they're rolling at let's say level 7, they're most likely not going to hit any upgrades. I want to make a special exception for reroll comps because reroll comps also really like refreshing their shops and buying units because they like to roll on a certain level. Next up, I want to cover leveling up. So the pros of leveling up is that you get a guaranteed upgrade for your team as we discussed before and you also get higher unit odds. The cons to leveling up is that it doesn't make your team that much stronger unless you have a key unit to put in and you must meet the leveling threshold to reap the benefits. So unlike refreshing your shop and buying units where you could roll either 10 gold, 20 gold, 30 gold, leveling up you just have to make the threshold. There's no such thing as being level 6 
and a half. So that means you would only do a level up if your team is already passable, but needs a minor upgrade. It also works well if you have a strong unit from your bench to put in. The last option we have is leveling up and rolling. So this is combining both of the last two options. This is great because you get guaranteed board strength from leveling up while also having a chance to improve your team during the roll down. However, this can be very expensive and sometimes after you level up, you don't have enough gold to actually get a real roll down because you didn't have much left over. However, using this option is crucial if your team is weak or if you have a lot of gold. Now let's bring health back into the equation. There are three stages of health, low, medium, and high, and this is all relative based on what stage you are in. However, if you are high health, you can choose to not spend gold to use your health as a resource. That's a term you may have heard before. This essentially converts your health into gold. So instead of using your gold, you could save it up and get interest every round. The only time you would spend gold if you are high health is if you are on a big win streak, and win streaking would get you more gold in the long run. You can also spend gold passively without losing anything by investing in levels if it doesn't cost you any interest. This is good because leveling up is a guaranteed upgrade, so you aren't really losing out or risking anything by leveling. It also ensures that your late game still keeps its potential. Now, if you're medium health, perhaps you could choose to either refresh your shop and buy units or level up. However, I would only recommend rolling if you have a lot of pairs on your bench as we stated before. If not, I would level up and wait to natural some pairs before rolling. So then that leaves leveling up as one of the other options. Since it's just a marginal but guaranteed upgrade, it's pretty good to level up if you just have medium health. However, as always, you need to assess the strength of your board if you need to do more than just leveling up, but worst case, you'll just become low health later on. But let's say that you don't upgrade your team that much by leveling up. The worst case that can happen is that you'll just be low health at the next stage, which is still playable. But let's talk about that right now. What do you do if you are low health? If you are low health, something drastic needs to be done because there is no breathing room anymore. You either have to roll a ton right now or level up and roll. Those are your only two options. You can't just sit there and passively level and you can't do nothing either. This is the time where you have to use your gold to protect your health. Finally, that brings us to items. Items are a bit odd. You can kind of greed your items to get perfect items later on, which gives you late game strength. And alternatively, you can slam items to get value from them earlier on. Use the same logic with items as you did with gold. The only thing you need to balance is knowing which items are good for particular comps because once you make an item, you can't unmake it. Therefore, in the start of the game, you should try to build flexible items. These won't be the best in slot items, but they will save you a lot of health, which will in turn allow you to have a lot more gold. At the same time, you don't want to just slam an item for the sake of slamming if the items are horrid because they still need to be somewhat useful. Treat items the same as gold. If you're low health, you need to build items, and if you are high health, you could afford to greed your items. Lastly, when do we make these decisions? There are generally a few key stages where you do this, but it's not set in stone, and you can also break the rules if it makes sense. But typically, the stages where you make a lot of these decisions are stage 3-2, 3-5, 4-1, 4, 5, and 5, 1. After stage 5, gold really isn't an important resource, so feel free to spend it. It's really just there to cap out your board, but if you spend all your gold on 5, 1, you can make a board that's good enough to top 4 in a lot of cases. If your board is strong enough on 5, 1 and you do have extra gold, those are the games where you want to aim to get a second or a first. Move on to team comps. Team comps decide how strong you are, which makes you save HP, which as we learned can get you more gold. But what makes a team comp good? A lot of people just copy a team comp that they see on a website, but they don't really know the ins and outs of why it works. Well, I'm going to explain that right now. First, there are raw stats. High stats beat low stats, but there are also multipliers. What are these? Well, I pretty much broke down team comps into two categories and then into further subcategories. So first, the most important thing is damage. Damage consists of having AD or AP depending on your comp, attack speed or mana, which is the frequency that you pump out the AD and AP, critical strike, which could be a multiplier, resistance shredding, which is reducing the resistance of your enemy team, anti-heal so that the damage you deal isn't healed back up, damage amplification such as the effects from Giant Slayer, Guard Breaker, or Ascension, and ableness to do damage, which is something like having range on your units, having a Quicksilver, or an Edge of Night. These are the seven conditions you need to meet in order to deal damage. After that, you have tankiness. Tankiness consists of health, resistances, healing, such as on your damage dealer or on your tank, and anti-damage. Anti-damage could be something such as like crowd control, debuffs, or backline access, such as being able to kill their damage dealer. You will notice that almost all good comps in TFT right now and historically fill almost all of these conditions. Of course, sometimes raw stats such as AD and AP and health can be so high that you don't need to fill the other conditions, but those comps are generally considered OP 
and get nerfed promptly. For all the other comps, they need to have a decent amount of raw stats, but they need to also combine it with the other things we discussed before such as resistance shredding, healing, or anti-damage as an example. These are multipliers for your team or anti-multipliers for your opponent. As you progress through the game, you'll need to add more and more of these conditions or raise your raw stats to stay competitive. So what's one example of how this works? First could be how to decide itemization for your tank. Some people may argue that having three Dragon Claws is great against magic damage damage dealers because Dragon Claw gives a ton of magic resistance, so it should be the most effective, right? However, what if I told you that two Dragon Claws and a Warmogs is actually more effective against magic damage even if we ignore the existence of magic resist shredding? The reason why is because of math and effective HP. You can go ahead and do the effective HP calculations yourself by typing it into a website, or you can just trust me. Essentially, the reason why one Warmogs and two Dragon Claws is better than three Dragon Claws against magic damage is because some Sometimes stacking one stat isn't as effective as spreading the love. Stats synergize with each other. So as a very simplified example, if you have three magic resists and one HP, it would multiply out to three. But with two magic resists and two HP, it would multiply out to four. Obviously, this is not the actual equation for effective HP, but what I'm essentially trying to say is that stacking a stat is often worse than investing in multiple stats due to math. And this isn't even including the other benefits you get against attack damage opponents. Let's get into the raw stats though. In the early game, you can get away with a small amount. Mid game, you want a medium amount. And in the late game, you want a big amount. But how do we get more of them? Well, either upgraded or rarer units give more stats. Ideally, you want to have both though. Other ways to get higher stats are through traits, items, and augments. So as the game goes on, you either want more traits or deeper traits, items, and augments. Now, remember how we said that we should invest in different stats? Well, let's add a bit more by saying that we should also invest in the different conditions as listed above. You don't want to go all in on stats, but have none of the resistance shredding, none of the anti-healing, and none of the ableness to do damage, for example. That's why you want to add in units that do crowd control for anti-damage. You probably want some resistance shredding through Static Shiv or Freljord, and then having something like a Sunfire Cape is always really nice too. Note that some of these conditions are binary while others are on a spectrum. You either have or don't have anti-heal, but you could almost have an unlimited amount of AD. That means you don't need to have two Sunfire Capes to be really heavy into anti-heal, because having one versus two is essentially essentially the same. When you pick out which units you want on your team, you want to try to invest in all the conditions listed above by filling out what I call a baseline. Filling out your baseline would be something like fulfilling all the binary conditions while having an average amount of the conditions that are on a spectrum. Maybe by stage 4-1 you have almost most of these covered and after that you want to focus on getting a higher amount of stats. By stage 5 you should probably fulfill all the conditions and hopefully get a high amount of stats. Obviously some conditions are optional, for example anti-heal sometimes isn't necessary necessary if opponents don't have healing or if your team has very high single target damage. In a high single target damage comp, the opponents do not have time to heal back up so it's not really necessary. Then stuff like critical strike isn't always available even if you really want it for your team. But you can get critical strike chance from glove items such as guard breaker or hand of justice because they both increase critical strike chance. But if your damage carry is spell reliant, then having an infinity edge, jeweled gauntlet, or jeweled lotus is almost necessary because this gives so much damage scaling it's almost ridiculous. It's like opening your third eye of damage. Combine critical strike with other damage amplifiers such as ascension or guard breaker, and then the stats you get from your traits and high cost units really really shine after that. Lastly, you need to be able to deal damage. Having all these items and stats and effects is really nice, but you need to be able to actually use it. So what does that mean? Uh, historically, range characters have been great carries because they naturally stay in the back and deal damage without interruption most of the time. Melee damage dealers, on the other hand need to be handled a bit differently because they are often targeted. So the first thing you could do to fix your melee carry is to turn it into a range carry by building a rapid fire cannon. But other ways to allow your melee carries to do damage is to build a quicksilver to avoid crowd control or an edge of night to give them some survivability. You can also just be flat out tanky. A lot of legendary melee carries are just so tanky and deal so much damage that you don't need specialty items for them to work. Lastly, healing is a great complementary condition for most damage dealers, especially melee carries because they take a lot more damage than your range carries, but it's still an important stat on both. Hextech, Gunblade, Bloodthirster, or Hand of Justice. Which one do you choose and why? I like Gunblade for backline carries because it also heals your tanks, and then Bloodthirster is great for melee carries because it gives them a shield, which again gives them more survivability since they're going to get hit more. Hand of Justice works well on both, but Hand of Justice works best on carries that like Critical Strike because it gives that stat. So if you have a Jeweled Gauntlet and you're looking for a healing item, probably Hand of 
Nemesis is going to be a little bit more effective than Gunblade or Bloodthirster. We've talked a lot about damage, but what about your other units? After all, most teams consist of 8 units, and you generally only care about one damage dealer. That means the rest of your team either needs to add to traits to increase your damage, or they need to provide utility or tankiness. For example, in a Shurima comp, while we're trying to go deep into the synergy, I like a unit like Talia more than a Renekton to complement your Azir's damage. The reason why I like Talia in a Shurima comp is because she provides utility to your team with her knockup. There are many other debuffs such as Chill, Resistance Shredding, and many others that help your team, and whenever you consider adding units onto your team later in the game, you need to make sure that they actually do one of the effects listed above. Luckily, the other thing you need to worry about, which is tanks, is a lot easier. Tanks pretty much just need health and resistances, so if you build a Warmog's Bramble Vest and Dragon Claw, those are going to be great items for almost any tank. You could experiment a little bit by having them fill other conditions, such as in a magic damage comp, adding in a Ionic Spark on your tank. That gives you a bunch of resistance shredding, so you don't need to build other items such as a Static Shiv. Alternatively, you could also build a Sunfire Cape, because again, it fills out one of these conditions. That's pretty much the basic fundamentals of TFT. A lot of people don't actually know what goes into playing TFT, and a lot of people don't know what actually makes a comp good, so I hope that this video shed a lot of light on that. If you have any questions or comments on this video, be sure to put a timestamp so that I know exactly which point of the video you're referencing. Of course, everything that you learned in this video is useless if you don't actually apply it, so make sure that you're actively thinking about both resource management and filling out conditions as you're playing your game. In the future, I'll be releasing more specific leveling guides, item guides, augment guides, and guides on the new set 9 mechanics such as portals and legends. Share my beginner guide with some of your friends who are trying to get into TFT, and then show them this fundamental video afterwards.